vital knowledge, clear explanations, and simplified answers about the rules of Islam to enable English-speaking Muslims to understand Islam properly and implement it correctly. Join Sheikh Asim al-Hakim on Ask Zed, coming live to you on Zed TV at the following times. Our media partner, Huda TV. A is for Allah, nothing but Allah. Ba is the beginning of Bismillah. Ta is for Taqwa, bewaring of Allah. And Tha is for Thawab, a reward. Ja is for Jannah, the garden of paradise. Ha is for Hajj, the blessed pilgrimage. Kha is for Khatim, the seal of the prophethood given to the prophet. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala al-mab'uuthi rahmatan lil-alameen Nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Amma ba'd Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to this new episode of Ask Zad. Ask Zad coming to you from Zad Studios here in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, live every Saturday between Maghrib and Isha, Mecca time. You will find the numbers as usual displayed at the bottom of your screens. Meanwhile, Uthman says his, in his question, if all is predestined, why do anything? Very short question that requires a lecture. Predestiny is one of the six pillars of Iman, of faith, that no Muslim can be a Muslim without believing in them. So the last sixth pillar of it all is to believe in predestiny. To believe in what Allah had ordained, whether it is good or other than that. Now, people are usually confused. So they ask, is everything written down of our future? Yes. My spouse? Yes. My children? My provision? Whatever is going to happen to me until I die? The answer is yes. The Prophet told us, alayhi salatu wasalam, when Allah, the Almighty, created the pen, he ordered the pen to write. And the pen asked, what should I write, O Lord? And Allah said, write the destiny of all of my creation till the day of judgment. The Prophet tells us, alayhi salatu wasalam, this was... 50,000 years before Allah created the creation. So this was before creating the universe as we know it. 50,000 years before. Everything is done and over with. So now the confusion lies. If Allah has predestined everything is going to happen in my life. So why do anything? So do you mean to tell me if I hold a pen and I decide to let it go, it's written in my book, it's written in the preserved, preserved tablet in the Lawh al-Mahfud? He said, yes. So if I drop it, it's written? He said, yes. If I decide not to drop it, it's also written. So whether you do or not do, everything is written. So I've dropped it, it's written. 50,000 years before Allah created the creation, it was written that on this specific day, at that specific moment, I will drop the pen. So, Uthman is asking, then why should we do what we do? Well, usually people think of the consequence, of the result. And they say, okay, I'm sick. Is it written that I will be cured? I said, yes. If not, is it written that I'm going to die? I said, yes. Then they ask, then why take the medication? Why have the doctor operate on me? Why don't I just leave it? Akhi, you're confusing the result 
and you're confusing the means that would lead to this result. Meaning, is it written that I will die of starvation? Maybe, I don't know. But let's assume it is written, though we don't know. If I do not prepare food, if I do not eat, if I go on a hunger strike, this is also written. So whatever you do uh, in regards to the means, this is written, and the result and the consequence is also written. So why only focus on the end result? Why do you always complain? I'm unable to find a job. Allah predestined upon me that I do not get a job. How do you know what Allah predestined that for you? He said, I, I'm not getting any job. He said, yes, because you're not working hard. You have to knock on all doors until Allah wills it and opens the door for you. Then you will find the job you want. Likewise, someone sitting home and says, if Allah wills it, I'll get a, a righteous, pious child. He said, yes, but you have to get married first. He said, nope. If Allah wills it, it will happen. This is not how it works. This is not how Allah told us to do. He told us to act and then Allah Azza wa Jal wills what happens. Likewise, in dua, my child is sick. Make dua for your child. He said, why should I make dua? Why should I make ruqya? If Allah predestined it, he will be cured. He said, yes, but your dua is part of the process of getting your child cured. And Allah ordered you to make dua. And if you refuse to make dua, Allah is, anger, is angry with you. Allah will be angered with you. And this shows the arrogance in you and refusing to humiliate yourself in front of Allah Azza wa Jal and, so, and show your need and poverty for Him. Besides, Allah Azza wa Jal is the owner, the sovereign owner of everything in this world. He demands that we show our submissiveness and our poverty to him through asking him because we do not know what lies in the future for us. So we have to do our due diligence. We have to exert all efforts possible to reach where we want to reach. And if it happens, Alhamdulillah, happened with the grace of Allah. If it didn't, Alhamdulillah, Allah willed something else and that something is better for us and Allah Azza wa knows best. A brother sends us a question saying, how to get rid of wiswas of Satan about kufr? I always have this wiswas that I have left the folds of Islam. Wiswas is an Arabic terminology which refers to what lingers in your mind. The whispering of Satan, of the devils, of your evil soul. So this is a wiswas. The last chapter of the Quran, chapter 114, Allah mentions this and describes Satan of being khannas, wiswas. Yuwaswisu fi sudurin nas. He whispers in people's chests and minds and try to infest it with things that would make them doubtful, depressed, tensed, stressed, etc. So brother is asking, how do we fight this? Satan uses a lot of different means in trying to infiltrate your defense mechanism. So he either comes to you through desires and whims and lusts. So he takes you away from the straight path. Or he comes to you through doubts about religion, about Allah, about the Quran, about the Sunnah. Doubts can be easily fought through knowledge. I get tens of people calling me every week complaining of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, having thoughts of this, having thoughts of that, and there is, there are, there is always a problem for them. And I keep telling them, if you learn Islam properly, if you read the Quran, read the tafsir, read the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, read the commentary on the sunnah, know your religion, know fiqh, then all of these doubts would 
be vaporized. It would disappear into thin air because Satan has no breeding grounds. You, his breeding grounds is your ignorance when you don't know your religion. So when you know your religion, you know your aqidah, you know your Lord and you have full confidence in your religion, whenever these doubts come, they are usually blocked. You, they, there is no way that it can infiltrate or penetrate your defense mechanism because you're holding on to the rope of knowledge and Islam of the Quran, etc. So how do we fight these whispers? First of all, you have to acknowledge that blocking these thoughts, fighting them, refusing to contemplate upon them, refusing to utter a single word to anyone about them or acting about them, acting upon them, in this case, Allah would forgive you. So whatever goes into my mind, if I don't speak about it, if I do not act upon it, and if I do not contemplate and I say, hmm, that sounds uh, to myself, that is logical. No, I keep on fighting it and uh, trying to block it. Allah would not hold me accountable for it. And may Allah make it easy for you. Abdullah from Canada. Abdullah. Hello. Yes. Salamatullah. Uh, Sheikh, my name is Asadullah. I think. Uh, ah, As you. Asadullah. Okay, I apologize. Yeah. No problem. No problem, Sheikh. How are you? I'm fine. Allah is zikr khair. What can I do for you, my friend? Uh, alhamdulillah. Uh, I, have, I have three questions for you, Sheikh. Okay, raise your voice a little bit. I'm unable to hear you properly. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Okay, so I got three questions for you, Sheikh. My first question is uh, what's the proper method for making the intention for wudu? for ghusl and for salah? Like, do you say it out loud or do you say it in your mind or what's the proper method? That's my first question. Okay. My second question, uh, my second question is, um, I've seen several of your videos on YouTube where you mentioned that uh, one of the best moments to make dua to God, uh, to Allah, is in sujood. So I was wondering if you could, is it permissible to say, like Sayyid al Astaghfar in Sujood, or is it permissible to say things like Rabbana Atina fit dunya and so on in Sujood? That's okay. my, obviously after after saying Subhana Rabbi al Ada. Okay. So that's my second question. And my final question is um, I have a friend who's involved in psychology, in the field of psychology, and he deals with patients who have addictions. Addictions like uh, alcohol, drugs, gambling, fornication, porn, and all that stuff. So one day he asked me, he said that, he was asking me about the forgiveness of Allah. He said, what, what happens in the situation if a man commits a sin and then he runs back to Allah, but then he commits the same sin, but then he runs back to Allah, and this keeps going on back and forth, and then eventually he stops sinning. Does Allah forgive him? That's, that's uh, my third question. Okay, I will answer and, it, inshallah. And forgive me for... Forgive me for saying one final thing. Uh, you mentioned in your previous um, statement about the destiny. Is it possible for the destiny to change? Okay, I will answer you. That's a good question. Barakallah feek. Okay, Asadullah from Canada had four questions. Let's go through them, inshallah, in a way that I hope that would make sense to Asadullah specifically and to the viewers in generally. Intention. In Arabic, and niyyah. So how do I make niyyah for wudu, for ghusl, for prayer? So what is intention? This is something no one knows of. Is it not true? When I say to someone, Akhi, your intention is evil. You wanted to do this and this and this. He would say, are you God? Only Allah knows the intention. And this is why the jurors, the fuqaha, say the intention is in the heart. What does that mean? Meaning that no one knows about it except me. So for example, if someone puts a dish of biryani in front of me, do I utter and say, I intend to reach out and grab a bite? If I want to go to the bathroom and answer the call of nature, do I say before entering, okay, I talk to myself, I intend to go and do my 101 or 102? Nobody does this. So the intention is something that is firm in your heart 
that you want to do it. So one is walking after making wudu in home to the masjid, enters the masjid, says Allahu Akbar, shaitan comes to him, ha, ah, you did not have intention for fart. He said, are you crazy? All what I have done is my intention. So actually, intention is something in your heart. You do not verbalize it. You do not say it verbally, nor you say it in your heart. So with your uh, uh, lips sealed, you don't say, I intend to pray dhuhr for rak'ah at 1 p.m. on the uh, uh, 20, what is it, in, on the 10th of February behind Imam Sheikh so-and-so. All of this is an innovation. You do not say anything. You know that this is dhuhr time or asr, whatever, and you simply praying the prayer of the time in the masjid. You simply say, Allahu Akbar, and you, and you, you uh, begin your prayer. So this is intention. Um, uh, secondly, he's asking in sujood, can we make dua? The answer is, uh, 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 this question was answered by the Prophet himself, alayhi salam. The Prophet said, alayhi salam, the closest a person is to Allah when he is prostrating. So choose whatever you want of dua, it is worthy of being answered. So the Prophet is telling us, alayhi salam, and encouraging us to make dua. The question is, one, can I make hadiths like Sayyid al-Istighfar in my sujood or the duas of the Qur'an? رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَنِ etc. All the duas in the Qur'an, the answer is yes. Question two, can I ask anything of this world or of the hereafter? Oh Allah, uh, help me buy a new car. No problem. Can I do it in fard or only in voluntary? You can do it in both. Can I say it in my own native language, English, Urdu, uh, uh, Uzbek, whatever, well, scholars and jurors say, if you know how to ask for this specific thing in your own native, in, your, uh, in, in Arabic, then you must. So, for example, I'd like Allah to forgive my sins. I know how to say, Rabbi ghfirli, or, or Allahumma ghfirli. I know how to say this in Arabic. So, it is not permissible to say, oh, oh God, forgive me, oh Allah, forgive me. But if I want to ask something, I don't know how to say it in Arabic, like, oh Allah, help me get the raise next year because for the past three years I did not get a raise and help me uh, uh, convince my boss of my good performance. I don't know how to say that in English either. So say it in your own native language and there's no problem in that. His third question was about a friend who uh, is a psychiatrist and he is asking specifically if a person sins and so often he commits the same sin after repenting. And this happens to all of us, unfortunately. So a person who smokes, he quits smoking for a week and then he goes back again. And then he, he quits for a month, repenting, feeling remorse, uh, intending not to go back to it. And all of a sudden after a big fat meal with some uh, uh, Turkish coffee, and he falls weak and lights a cigarette. And then he leaves it. Eventually, he quits. Does Allah Azza wa forgive all of that? The answer is yes. Even if he does not quit, as long as the process is being followed, which is after the sin, he repents, he feels remorse, he intends truly not to go back, he quits it immediately, he's sincere of doing it for the sake of Allah, Allah forgives him. If he falls back and sins again and then repents, Allah forgives him. If he does this five, ten gazillion times, Allah is, one of his names is most forgiving, most merciful. Allah is ghafoor, ghafir, ghaffar. All of these are part of his names, beautiful names which all revolve around forgiveness. So fear not from not being uh, forgiven, inshallah. And his last question was about uh, predestiny. Can it be changed? There are two types of destiny. Destiny that is written and was over done with. And this is unchangeable, which is in 
Umm al-Kitab, in the preserved uh, uh, tablet. And there is a sub-predestiny which is dependent on the reasons. So it is written that if my slave, if my servant were to connect to his uncles and aunts this year, we will expand his age from 60 to 65. And if he does that, we will give him um, provision and sustenance of so-and-so. So it is dependent on the reasons. And this is what the angels see. So they might rub uh, uh, out and rewrite it again in their books. But what's in the preserved, uh, preserved uh, uh, tablet, it's the same that does not change. And this is why when we make dua, your destiny changes. The one that the angels know of, not the one that only Allah knows of and Allah knows best. Uh, Burak from Macedonia. Yes. Yes, my friend. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, uh, now we have the paper money and uh, the Muslims are wondering whether it is uh, halal or it is darura for the Muslim. Okay. Any so more questions? Question. Is, it, is it halal or is it darura? Okay. Any more questions? No. I will answer you, inshallah. So, uh, uh, Barak uh, is asking about paper money or currency. Is it halal to use or is it something out of necessity? Meaning without it, we are unable to um, behave. We, we cannot, we have to do this uh, uh, in order to get it over with. What is the reason of asking such a question? Usually because there is those who come and make you videos, uh, YouTube videos saying that these paper uh, 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 currencies or money is worthless, it has no uh, uh, backing, it has no value, and this is all from the Dajjal, and they start making yani, uh, uh, a Bollywood movie out of it. And to tell you the truth, until uh, recently, maybe like 30 or 40 years ago, each currency was backed by silver or gold. So actually, when you gave that currency, you got in return for it silver or gold, until 30 or 40 years ago, they stopped this and now it has become sort of printing uh, uh, currency. But this does not mean it has no value. The currency as it stands today is backed by the country issuing it. It is backed by the central bank. It is backed by the financial institutions worldwide. So it's not like Bitcoin something out of the blue coming and, 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 and making this big, great bubble. No, this is something that all Muslims and non-Muslims alike, they agree that this banknote, this currency, whether it's a real, a euro, a dollar, a, 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 a yen or whatever, they all agree that it is, worse, it is worth so-and-so, that we can buy, it has a buying power, purchasing power, you can buy things with it, you can sell things with it, and it is not a commodity. People acknowledge it as a currency. So my point of view is that it is totally halal. Uh, 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 Barak, you and the others, if you guys have any doubt in it, I'll send you my bank account. You can deposit all what you ha are doubtful in it, get rid of it, I'll do a lot of good things inshallah, and maybe some bad things, Allah knows best. But this is not logical. This is what everyone on earth is dealing with. So to come and say that is it halal or a necessity? Well, either way, we have to deal with it until the, uh, uh, um, something different happens and people go back to dealing with gold and currency, which was the case centuries ago, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. We have a short break. Stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back. 
محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم الله وبركاته Today we're going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam raised their moral by mentioning the virtues in the hereafter. Abdullah bin Amr ibn al-As radiyallahu anhu reported that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Do you know who will be the first to enter paradise among Allah's creations? They said, Allah and his messenger knows best. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The first that will enter paradise among Allah's creation are the poor muhajireen that are used to close the gaps that are fed for in the stronghold and they are the ones that protect against evil things. One of them will die with his need in his chest but he is unable to fulfill it. Allah the Almighty will say to whomever he wishes among his angels, go to them and greet them. The angels will say, we are the residents of your heavens and the best of your creation. Do you order us to go to them and greet them? Allah will say, they were slaves that worshipped me and did not associate anything with me in worthy. They were used to close the gaps that were feared and they were used to do away with anything evil. One of them will die and with his need in his chest but cannot find any way to fulfill it. So the angels go to them at that and will enter on them from every door saying peace be on you for your patience and excellent is the final abode. Reported by Ahmed, Al-Albani ruled it authentic in his book, At-Ta'liqat al Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Uh, Gemma, I think I'm pronouncing the name right, is complaining of losing track and lagging behind. He or she says that now I'm lazy to do any of the good things that I used to do. Um, I have decreased in a lot of good deeds in a short time span, and I find it hard to do them now. Uh, is this a sign that Allah is angry with me? First of all, Whenever a person finds the strength and momentum to do good deeds, this is a clear sign that Allah loves him. Because Allah Azza wa Jal gives this world, give health, wealth, and materialist, materialistic things to those whom he loves and to, to those whom he hates. So you look at the disbelievers, and you find them having health, wealth, and everything they want. But Allah does not give belief, does not give iman, does not give content, except to those whom he loves. Therefore, if you look and analyze your life and find that you are lagging behind and that your iman is being reduced, drastically this means that there is something wrong in your life and this is what's causing this it's cause and effect climbing up a mountain is quite difficult and it requires a lot of fitness and strength coming down anyone can do it climbing is difficult going down is so fast and easy you would, wouldn't even notice it therefore Reaching the peak is difficult. Maintaining it is next to impossible. Unless Allah Azza wa Jal gives you the strength and the tawfiq to maintain this. So I advise you, Gemma, to look into your lifestyle. Whatever was introduced 
that may help or cause in reducing your level of Iman, your night prayer, your dhikr or word of the Quran that you used to maintain reciting every single night, fasting Mondays and Thursdays, staying away from sins. Sometimes the reason for this is that there are certain sins that we used to be strict in not doing. Now we've started to compromise. We started to think that time changes. It's okay every now and then to do this or to do that. And this has a drastic impact on your Iman. So you need to look into this thoroughly. Muhammad says, what's the ruling on leasing a house? Because people tell me it's riba. And I don't understand how it can be riba since we're not paying or giving any riba to anyone. I need some clarification. First of all, Muhammad, riba is different categories. Riba al-fadl, riba al-nasi'ah, riba al-qard, etc. I'm not going to go through this. Usually the most well-known type of riba is the riba that is related to the debt. So the more time span is added, the higher the debt is. Time of payment is 1st of March. Give me my money. He says, I can't. He says, okay, I'll delay you a couple of months, but you will have to pay me 5% extra. This is riba. So he's asking about leasing houses. Leasing houses, leasing properties, there's nothing wrong in that. If it is true leasing, meaning I get your apartment for uh, uh, $800 or $1,000 a month. A deal, a deal. Done. So this is no problem. Every month I give you $1,000. There's no problem in that, none whatsoever. There is nothing hidden, meaning that after 20 years I will possess this apartment. No. It's simple renting. Like renting a car, rent, there's no, nothing wrong in that. When does it become a riba? When people flip it and twist it so that it fits their whims and desires. So you have a flat, an apartment, a house, and I'm interested on, uh, in, in living in it. So I come to you and I say, listen, I'd like to get your apartment for the next five years. Is that okay with you? I said, yes, I'm, I'm, le I'm leasing. I said, okay, how much is the rent? And he says, $1,000 a month. So that makes it uh, $12,000. That's making $60,000 for the five years period. So I come to you and I say, listen, I have another proposal. I'll give you $200,000 as a deposit so that I can live in this apartment for five years. Monthly basis, I'll give you like $50 or $100, nothing, peanuts. But at the end of the period, when I am moving out, you return the $200,000 back to me. And the landlord said, that's a good deal. You're on. This is riba. Why? Because actually, as a tenant, I am lending $200,000 to the landlord. Uh, and he's benefiting from it. He's using whatever he wants to do with it so that he would return it after five years. Meanwhile, me occupying his apartment for five years, paying nothing, this is the interest over the loan. So this is riba. I don't know if this is fits what you're doing or you're asking about or not. General leasing or renting is halal and there's nothing wrong with it. But if it's like I had just described, this is totally prohibited. Basit. Basit says, how can we understand that if Allah is testing us or bad things happen in our lives because of our uh, own deeds? Whatever calamities take place, whatever happens to me, this has two reasons. Either Allah Azza wa Jal is punishing me from sins that I had committed. One of the Salaf says, when I sin, when I commit a sin, I can see that in how my wife deals and treats me 
or in my ride, my horse, my car, uh, uh, something wrong happens. So he says that I can immediately see the effect of my sin on my life. So this is part one. The other way of, or the other reason behind the calamity, you, you do not have any sins, but Allah Azza wa Jal wants to elevate your status in paradise and increasing you in good deeds through your patience and your tolerance. So you cannot tell which is which. All what you can do is be patient, be content, and say Alhamdulillah. Mustafa from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you doing, Sheikh? I'm fine, Zakallah Khair, for asking. What can I do for you? Uh, Sheikh, I'm having two questions, actually. One of my questions is, uh, how do I know that I'm too truthful to Allah? Like, uh, in my in my deed, in my body, how do I know really that I'm truthful to Allah? Uh, that's my first question. The second question is uh, uh, regarding checking on with the opposite sex. Like, uh, you know, we are in a secular place where there is a lot of mixture. mixture. So uh, any time that I decide that I'm not going to check uh, on with uh, my classmates, my friend in college, what? If I have the intention, what, once they come near directly, they are the first one who stretch their hand. So I feel shy. I really, really, I don't want. Do you have any any secret, like uh, anything to to advise me regarding that issue? What what issue is it? Shaking hands with women? Yeah, yeah, that one. Really, I'm I'm, I'm struggling with that. Shake any time, but I decide not to do it. Okay. Definitely, I'm doing it. Okay, I will so answer you. Give, just give it a answer. I will answer you. May Allah bless you. Barakallah fiqh. Okay, brother Mustafa from India had two questions. First, how can I be truthful with Allah Azza wa Jal? This requires a big uh, 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 discussion, uh, a long lecture, because it is not a pill that you just swallow or an injection you just take and it's done and over with. Being truthful with Allah Azza wa Jal is a way of life. So it includes knowing Allah Azza wa Jal, knowing his beautiful names and attributes knowing what he had done to the previous impoverished nations before us and how he destroyed them for their blasphemy and for their shirk. Knowing Allah's powers, which is unlimited. You cannot even think about it, but you just see the traces of it. His wisdom, his knowledge, his power, his wealth, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, Knowing your own shortcomings, knowing your own weaknesses. If you do what you do for the sake of Allah, and how would I know that I'm truthful? Simply by not being affected when people criticize you or praise you. This is a sign of sincerity and a sign of being truthful. So if I do something for the sake of Allah, and then I go ask people, how was it? Was, was I good? How do you, how do you think I, my prayer was? Uh, how do you think my hajj was? Did I do something uh, uh, that you like? If someone criticizes me over something I did for the sake of Allah, and I feel depressed, why? I have to excel next time. I have to uh, prove myself to the people. Then there is a problem. Once praising of the people and their criticism is equal in your eyes, meaning that you're truthful and you're doing what you're doing for the sake of Allah, and Allah knows best. His second question is, I'm having problems with shaking hands with women. How, what to do? It is easy for me in a Muslim country to say, avoid women. But someone who's in a non-Muslim country, someone who's a minority, this might be a little bit difficult. So there are ways of avoiding this. One of them is keep your distance. When does someone comes to you with a stretched hand for shaking when you're close, when there's a proximity that is so close and near? The moment you step three steps back, putting your hands on your chest and just greeting them by hi, good morning, 
and you show that you don't want the gap to be narrowed, no one will shake hands with you. Will they be offended? Who gives a, who cares? <laughs> who cares? I don't care if they get offended or not. I care whether Allah would throw me in hell because of that or not. The Prophet says, والسلام, it is better or it is best for a person to be stabbed in his head with a needle made of iron rather than to touch a woman that is not permissible for him. So always keep this in mind. If you feel embarrassed, if you feel shy not to shake hands, remember what's, uh, what awaits you on the day of judgment in hell. And the more you try to not get involved in mixed gatherings or meetings, the better you will find it, inshallah, and easier for you to avoid such uh, situations. Uh, Maryam says that she has a confusion between two hadiths. The first hadith, the Prophet says, من حسن الإسلام المرئي تركه ما لا يعني it is a sign of a person's uh, um, good Islam that he does not investigate, that he does not snoops, that he does not put his nose in things that do not relate to him. And then there is another hadith where the Prophet tells us whenever any one of you sees some, something wrong happening, he should stop it with his hands, if not, then with his uh, tongue, uh, and if not, then with his uh, heart. So she has this confusion. There's no need for confusion. Whenever a sin is being committed in front of you, this is part of your duty because the one who told you to mind your own business is the one who told you whenever you see something sinful being committed in front of you that you have to prevent it. But the first hadith, which يعني, in short says, mind your own business, is related to things that do not affect the community. It's not sinful, it doesn't affect me. Such as, so many times I sit with someone in, 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 in the plane or uh, on the plane or uh, when we're traveling or um, we, uh, at the waiting room at, in a hospital and he says, Salaam Alaikum Alaikum Salaam. How are you, Alhamdulillah? And he keeps on interrogating me. How old are you? Hmm, married? How many? How many kids? And then he goes on a little bit personal. Uh, working? Uh, what's your salary? Excuse me? This is none of your business. So this is something that shows you do not have good Islam. Unlike when someone is smoking next to me and I say, Akhi, may Allah forgive you, but smoking is haram and we are in a non-smoking area. So please extinguish your cigarette. If I see someone not praying, I say, Akhi, where is the masjid? And he says, it's there. I said, have they prayed? He said, no. I said, okay, let's go and pray. Yeah, you, you try to use diplomacy, but you have to forbid evil and enjoin uh, uh, righteousness. Muddathir from uh, Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Allah. I have a question. Uh, one of my aunts uh, recently passed away last week. Uh, May Allah have mercy India. on her soul. I mean, uh, she passed away in India, and I came to know about uh, it uh, after they buried her. Okay. And I prayed uh, Saratul Janaza in Saudi Arabia here uh, after she was buried. Is that okay? Okay. Any more questions? Well, uh, another question. Uh, is it okay to uh, perform an Umrah on behalf of her? I'm not sure uh, if she was a practicing Muslim, but is it still okay? Okay. Any more questions? Uh, that's all, Sheikh. Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. So, Brother Mudathir says that his aunt died in India, and after her burial, he came to know that she died and was buried. So, he performed Salatul Janaza, the funeral prayer, here in Saudi Arabia, known as Salatul Ghaib, the uh, funeral prayer performed on behalf of an absentee, someone who died and he's not present physically. This is an issue of dispute among scholars. And the most authentic opinion is that it is not permissible to offer such an absentee funeral prayer when the deceased had been already prayed upon by the Muslims. Let me explain this in a nutshell. Someone dies in Siberia. 
no Muslims around, they buried him. Someone dies in the jungles of Africa, all uh, uh, idol worshiper tribes, no Muslim with them, they buried him. In this case, we pray the absentee funeral prayer as did the Prophet ﷺ with an Najashi, the Abyssinian ruler who embraced Islam but had no Muslim person around him. When he died, the Prophet ordered the, prof uh, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to pray funeral prayer. But if someone died in a Muslim country or in a place where Muslims offered funeral prayer, in this case, we do not do this and Allah knows best. Secondly, he says, can I offer Umrah uh, on her behalf because I'm not sure that she was practicing or not. What does that make uh, uh, any difference? It doesn't. As long as she was a Muslim and she did not nullify her Islam, she wasn't a grave worshiper. She did not worship the Prophet ﷺ, believed that he is uh, Hazar Nazar controlling the universe and she did not supplicate to him to bring uh, uh, benefit and to prevent evil. She uh, did not believe in sorcery, uh, yani she did not perform sorcery or black magic, etc. upon people, etc. As long as she was a normal Muslim, yes, you can go and perform Umrah, perform Hajj, give charity, make dua for her and Allah knows best. So Ismail says, is it permissible to recite the dua said in the janazah prayer in one's own language when you perform funeral prayer? First takbir, read Fatiha. Second takbir, offer salutation to the Prophet ﷺ. Third takbir, we make dua for the deceased. So he's saying, can we make it in our own language? The answer is yes, providing you don't know how to do it in Arabic. If you know the uh, dua in Arabic, it should be done in Arabic. Otherwise, there's no problem. Dahira says, what is supposed to be the characteristics of, a loving, of loving someone for the sake of Allah? Loving someone for the sake of Allah means that you do not love him for worldly matters. So I love Abdullah. He's a good friend. Why do you love him? Akhi, he gives me dirty jokes every now and then and he makes me laugh. A'udhu billah. This is not for the sake of Allah. Uh, well, actually he's rich and I'm hoping that he may give me a car or a, a, a precious gift. This is not for the sake of Allah. Uh, he's influential. He can, you know, uh, break rules and make things easy for me. This is not for the sake of Allah. Loving someone for the sake of Allah because Allah loves them, whether it is because of their righteousness, truthfulness, generosity, because they pray in the first uh, row of the masjid, because they're kind to their uh, parents, because they're loving to their children, because they're good for, with their neighbors, because they are knowledgeable, they teach me things. All of these things that draw you closer to Allah, loving a person for it is for the sake of Allah and Allah knows best. Mikhail from Poland. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, I have uh, some historical question. Uh, in uh, 1453, the uh, victorious Muslim army took uh, Constantinople. I, and, uh, I'm, unable, I'm unable to understand you, um, uh, Mikhail. Uh, can you speak a little bit slower, please? That, Sheikh, do you hear me clearly now? Yes, but uh, slowly, slowly, please. I'm an old man. I cannot... Very well. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sheikh, in... Uh, 1453, a uh, victorious Muslim army took over Constantinople. Okay. And because of uh, this sack, they um, uh, took also this big cathedral, which is called Hagia Sophia. Okay. And with time, they converted this uh, cathedral, this church, into a massage. And my question to you, uh, Sheikh, respectful Sheikh, is... If it was correct, according to the Muslim uh, art of war and uh, by the uh, Sunnah of, um, uh, of our Prophet, uh, and uh, you know, to convert mm. this kind of uh, church into the massage. Okay. Any more question? No, that's it. Yes. I will ask. I will answer, inshallah. Brother Mikhail uh, says that Al Qustantiniya, 
well known now as Istanbul. It was conquered by the Muslims in 14, whatever, and there was um, a, a church, maybe Hagia Sophia, was transferred, transformed into a masjid. Is this permissible? The answer is no. Taking a church and turning it into a masjid, a mosque, this is not permissible because they have to keep their buildings of worship. It is not permissible for the Muslims to take over these houses of worship, synagogues for the Jews or churches for the Muslims, and do these things first forcefully. However, if they had sold it, and this is clearly found in the UK, I've seen literally hundreds of churches being sold to the Muslims. They come to the Muslims and say, Akhi, nobody's coming. And the building is here and we need the money. So will you buy it from us? And they come to us and they say, we need donations. We uh, uh, raised fundraising from the States, from Germany. And they, mashallah, collect and they buy it and transfer it, transform it into a masjid. There's nothing wrong in that. This is the, the same thing is happening in the States, in all of Europe, alhamdulillah. So to claim that the Muslims took it by force and changed it into um, a, a masjid, I have no reason to believe this. I personally do not believe that the Ottoman uh, Empire would do such a thing or those who came before, I'm, I'm not good at history. Muslims do not do this. It is totally against their religion. What I know is that it was given to them and they had all the goodwill of giving it to the Muslims to change it because probably there were no Christians or no, no uh, practicing Christians who used it. And uh, this is what had happened. I know for sure that a lot of the masjids were turned into temples, like the Babri Masjid in India, about 20 or so years ago of, uh, 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 in India, how they demolished the uh, masjid and they built their temple on it. And this is unfortunate, but this is what has happened. And so many places in the world, in Burma, in uh, uh, these countries where the Muslims are being harassed, oppressed, and slaughtered because of their religion. So this, I have no knowledge in history, but I'm almost confident that it is not uh, uh, as was described. Uh, I, I, I believe that this brings us to the end of today's or tonight's program. Uh, a reminder, next week, inshallah, same time between Maghrib and Isha, Mecca time. As every Saturday, up until that time, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A is for Allah, nothing but Allah Ba is the beginning of Bismillah Ta is for Taqwa, bewaring of Allah And Tha is for Thawab, a reward Ja is for Jannah, the garden of paradise Ha is for Hajj, the blessed pilgrimage Kha is for Khatim, the seal of the prophethood Given to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam